Greetings, Nick with Sweetwater here, and today's topic is this one. Boost, overdrive, distortion, and fuzz pedals. What's the darn difference anyway? This is far from a new question, my friend. It's one that's been asked countless times already. We'll no doubt continue to get asked ad infinitum. Why? Because the lines that separate these pedal types, especially overdrive and distortion, are pretty darn blurry, that's why. And to make matters even worse, I've seen many answers online that only serve to confuse rather than clarify. Not good. To add further to this age-old dilemma, there has never been a wider array of boost, overdrive, distortion, and fuzz pedals to choose from than right now. I mean, at the time of filming this video, Sweetwater offers no fewer than 460 of these dirt-enhancing and delivering devices. That's a lot of pedals, my friend. An awful lot. If you just tried one a day, it would take you well over a year to check them all out. Choice paralysis, indeed. To hopefully help clarify any muddy waters that may lurk, here's my take on the basic differences between the big four families of dirt delivering devices. Namely, once again, boost, overdrive, distortion, and fuzz. And for what it's worth, this is not only based on over 35 years of personal tone chasing by myself, which involved a lot of trial and even more error, it's also culled from the wise words I got from many artists, guitar techs, and pedal designers I've had the good fortune to chat with over the years. And all of them are way, way, way smarter than I am, incidentally. Not that that's a hard thing to accomplish. <laughs> In a nutshell, all the pedals we're discussing here have the same end game objective. To make your guitar tone bigger, bolder, gnarlier, edgier, heavier, dirtier, and nastier. In a good way, of course. And all of them can and will do the above, when used correctly, by the way. Duh. That said, each of these four food groups do it differently and in varying degrees too. In terms of their desirable signal altering abilities, I'd liken boost, overdrive, distortion, and fuzz to the four heat options I once encountered in a great Eastern restaurant that specialized in spicy food, namely mild, medium, hot, and insane, with every single option being tonally tasty, of course. <laughs> Let's cut to the chase, shall we? First, though, we need to quickly address the proverbial elephant in the room. Distortion. Yes, sir. Distortion is a word we guitarists throw around all the time, ad nauseum, actually. But what does it actually mean? And more importantly, how is it created? To address this, I immediately went to the Googles to get a dictionary definition of the word in question. And here it is. Distortion. The act of twisting or altering something out of its true natural or original state. And even more relevant to us guitarists, the following statement was also included in the same definition. Audio distortion, falsified reproduction of an audio signal caused by changing the original signal's waveform. To get a better understanding of exactly what distortion is and what it does, let's take a quick look at the true natural state of a clean guitar signal before it is twisted and altered into distortion. To that end, here's a simple sine wave image, one I'm sure you've seen countless times already. Simplistically speaking, this is what a sound wave looks like. The way pedals, amps, tubes, and or speakers distort this nice, smooth, symmetrical shape is by chopping off the tops and bottoms of this waveform. This chopping off is often referred to as clipping, which makes perfect sense. Also, the tops and bottoms of the sine wave are often called peaks and troughs. Got it? Good. Simplistically speaking, this chopping can be done in three ways. Subtly, harshly, or in a totally brutal, medieval fashion, a la one of my favorite movies, Pulp Fiction. 
The first two chopping methods, let's call them gentle and not so gentle, are often referred to as soft clipping and hard clipping, respectively. Here's a pretty simplistic diagram, my favorite word of this video, by the way, simplistic, of said soft and hard clipping of a sine wave. As you can see from the orange lines in this image, the peaks and troughs of the sine wave remain rounded when soft clipping occurs. They're just a little blunter and shorter, that's all. The result is a subtle yet noticeable change. So to do the soft clipping, we've effectively just clipped a little bit off the top and the bottom of the sine wave. That's why it's called soft clipping. <laughs> Soft clipping heard and explained, let's go back to our diagram and take a quick look at what hard clipping is. As the red lines show, when hard clipping occurs, the tops of the peaks and the bottom of the sine wave valleys are no longer rounded, they've been flattened. Yes sir, the clipping here is a little harder, it's not so gentle, hence the term hard clipping. <laughs> As for the final clipping option, the medieval one, well, when this happens, the peaks and troughs of the sine wave are totally beheaded in a truly brutal fashion. As you can see in this extremely basic diagram of said beheading, the brutality of this type of clipping literally transforms our once smooth and curvaceous sine wave into a square wave. Make sense? <laughs> While purposely avoiding going too far into the fascinating but deep rabbit hole that is distortion, each one of these three clipping types also changes the harmonic content of each note. They do so by adding new frequencies to the note's fundamental undistorted frequency, and thus gloriously deformed new sounds are created, the ones we guitarists know and love as overdrive, distortion, and fuzz. Also, the clipping involved is often asymmetrical as opposed to symmetrical. And that's just a fancy way of saying that the peaks and troughs are often clipped a little differently, adding further to the resulting sonic mayhem. Our next logical question is this one. How on earth do you distort a guitar signal anyway? Let's quickly deal with this too. As we've just learned, the deed of distorting is done via clipping a note's waveform and thus adding extra harmonics to it. There are two basic ways this can be done. And to help visualize them both, let's imagine that our simple, undistorted sound wave is a fellow named, wait for it, Mr. Wave. This fella on the screen joining me right here. And we'll also imagine that the signal path our new pal Mr. Wave will be traveling down is a corridor with a ceiling. Make sense? Good. This explained, let's take a quick look at another picture of a sine wave. The red lines at the very top and bottom of this diagram indicate the maximum output level of the signal path our wave is traveling. It's threshold, if you will. And as also indicated, the space between the peaks and troughs of the signal's waveform and these two red threshold lines is known as headroom. And last, but certainly not least, the height of the wave measured from top to bottom or peak to trough is called amplitude. So if we go back to our guy walking down a corridor analogy, Threshold is the height of the corridor ceiling, while the wave's amplitude is how tall our chap Mr. Wave is. Make sense? Let's look at a dodgy diagram I drew earlier. See what I mean? The height of the corridor is the threshold, and the wave's amplitude is how tall our guy is. So the headroom is the amount of room between the top of our man's head and the corridor ceiling. Make sense? I think it does. Therefore, logic dictates there are two ways we can create distortion. We can make our guy taller than the corridor, or we can make the ceiling of the corridor lower than the height of Mr. Wave. Or a little bit of both, of course. Now, obviously when the corridor ceiling is taller than Mr. Wave is, he can walk down it with ease, just like this. Yep, no problem here. Mr. Wave is walking proud and tall. No distortion happening at all. Mr. Wave is Mr. Clean at the moment. <laughs>
When our guy Mr. Wave is a little taller than the corridor though, let's see what happens. Yep, as you'd expect, he can no longer stand up straight when walking down the corridor this time. He has to bend his head and knees in order to do so. He's definitely had to distort his body a little, but he's still smiling. This is effectively soft clipping, if you will. Make sense? <laughs> Obviously, the taller Mr. Wave gets relative to the height of the corridor ceiling, the more distorted he has to become in order to walk down it. Let's take another look. As you can see in this awfully drawn image, Mr. Wave has had to distort his body a lot more so he can continue walking down the corridor. It's definitely getting harder for our friend. He's looking at the floor and he's even stopped smiling. Yep, this is definitely hard clipping in action. <laughs> And I think you've probably already guessed what's coming next. Yup, it's square wave time. As you can see, poor Mr. Wave is now reduced to traveling down the corridor on his hands and knees, and even his face is pretty distorted. Yup, this looks pretty brutal now. He's being tortured, and he's definitely in square wave form. <laughs> And so ends our quick, simple overview of the much more complex sonic subject that is guitar distortion in all its glory. I hope it proves useful, and I apologize once again for my simply awful sketching skills. <coughs> distortion discussion done, let's talk stomp boxes now, shall we? We'll start with boost pedals and then work our way up the distortion ladder. Firstly though, a little bit of dirty guitar trivia. The first ever guitar pedal that generated distortion was the fuzz. Before this groundbreaking pedal was born in the 1960s though, the often criminally overlooked Link Ray recorded a single in 1958 called Rumble, a rock and roll instrumental that featured a gratingly distorted guitar sound. How did Link achieve this landmark of dirty tone? By poking holes in his speaker cones with a pencil, that's how. Don't try this at home though kids, it will void your warranty. Rumble was banned by US radio, but inspired the likes of Pete Townsend of The Who to pick up the guitar. Link may not have been the first to record with a distorted guitar sound, but his influence is irrefutable. Trivia over, let's quickly get into boost pedals, shall we? Simply put, the fundamental way a typical boost pedal differs from OD distortion and fuzz stomp boxes is this. It doesn't add distortion. I repeat, it does not add distortion to your signal. Why? Because unlike its dirtier bigger brothers, a pure boost pedal doesn't contain a clipping circuit. That's why, as its name suggests, a boost pedal's function is purely to make your guitar signal louder without adding any distortion to it. They're effectively sonic magnifying glasses, if you will. They just make your guitar signal bigger. To emphasize this no distortion added truth, Manufacturers will often use the term clean boost when describing such a pedal's function. This said, a clean boost pedal can and will overdrive an amp into distortion. As we've just learnt, when your guitar signal is bigger than the threshold of your amp's preamp, distortion will occur. This is often referred to as front-ending an amp and is highly desirable to many, myself included. Because of this, boost pedals are often used by rock guitar players to push an already overdriven slash crunchy amp even further over the distortion cliff, just like this. Here's my amp sound without the exotic EP boost pedal engaged. <laughs> As you can hear, it's got some grit, but of course, I want more. So let's kick in the EP boost, which can add up to 20 dBs of clean boost. Let's check it out. Mission accomplished, I think. I like it. 
And just so you know, a boost pedal can also add a desirable edge or grind to an overdrive or distortion pedal when placed in front of it and both pedals are engaged. Yup, stacking distortion enhancing pedals can be a very good thing. Also to this end, quite a few overdrive and distortion pedals have switchable boost options built into them. A very good example of this is the excellent Wampler Plexi Drive. I love this one. Plus it's got the British flag on it. Perfect. Now, a literal clean boost pedal will invariably just have one control for, wait for it, level or boost. Just like this fine Wampler one I've got in my hand or the EP I've just used. Yep, it's trivia time again. This time it's treble boost trivia. I feel it's worth pointing out that Tony Iommi of Black Sabbath, the man many consider to be the godfather of heavy metal and quite rightfully so, often used a modified Rangemaster treble booster to front end his overdriven tube amps. Now, a lot of folk at the time assumed he was using a fuzz pedal, but that wasn't the case. Because of this, the excellent Catalin bred Sabracadabra pedal emulates Tony's treble boost use via its clever range control. Let's check it out. <laughs> And that little bit of trivia leads us nicely into overdrive pedals. Now these bad boys normally have at least three controls. One for volume, one for drive, and one for tone. Some though also go as far as having controls for bass, middle, and treble too, allowing further tonal tweakability, just like this beauty in my hands right here. As an overdrive pedal obviously adds distortion to your signal, the understandable, What's the darn difference between overdrive and distortion pedals anyway question is often asked. The alleged very simple answer is this. The difference is determined by both the degree and also the nature of the distortion the pedal adds to your sound. Overdrive pedals are warm and round sounding while distortion boxes are invariably hotter and add both aggression and edge. Yup, in a nutshell, generally speaking, overdrive pedals add that rounder, soft clipping we discussed earlier, which is why they are often described by their makers as emulating the sound of an overdriven tube amp in the literature. To the ears and fingers of many, including some of the most revered tonesmiths out there, the sound of an overdrive pedal being used to push uh, an already overdriven tube amp over the edge is a highly desirable one. And part of the reason for this is that the resulting complex crunchy combination of the pedal and amps overdrives together just can't be achieved by either unit alone. They have to work together. It should also be pointed out that this is often done with the overdrive pedal's volume control cranked while the gain control on the pedal is dialed back a tad. Thus effectively, kind of sort of making it a clean boost unit with a desirable smidgen or three of extra dirt added, of course. It should also be pointed out that certain overdrive units either boost or attenuate certain frequencies. For instance, the legendary tube screamer, this bad boy right here, boosts the mids, giving them a nice hump, and at the same time, it rolls off the lows, thus tightening up your guitar sound very effectively too. Let's check out a highly affordable JHS screamer pedal in action, shall we, on an already overdriven amp. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to play a riff once without the screamer on, and then engage the sucker. Let's check it out. <laughs> Next up are distortion pedals. And as already stated, the main difference between overdrive and distortion is aggression. Once again, overdrives deliver soft clipping while distortion boxes go harder, way, way, way harder. Let's quickly check out the Walrus Errors pedal, for example. Here's the amp with the pedal off. And now let's kick on the Walrus, shall we? I 
We got carried away there a bit. That's hard. Let's do the same exact thing with another distortion pedal, shall we? The much revered and much used Proco Rat. Once again, here's the amp with the rat off. <laughs> And now with some rat action. <laughs> Nice! As you've just heard, distortion pedals produce a harder, edgier, more aggressive distortion than overdrive pedals do, while remaining pretty darn tight and articulate at the same time. Now, because of the sheer amount of gain a distortion pedal is capable of, a lot of guitar players use them with a clean sounding amp, just like I did. That stated, a fair few axemen have used a distortion stomp box in front of an overdriven amp to wonderful effect, including the late great Randy Rhodes, who used an MXR Distortion Plus to slam the front end of an already cranked 100 watt Marshall stack even harder. Here's my amp with a fair bit of grit without the pedal. <laughs> But guess what? Yup, I want more. Distortion plus kind of more. Let's check it out. Unlike overdrive pedals though, Due to the sheer amount of saturation a distortion pedal invariably adds to your tone, they aren't super responsive to subtle picking nuances. Especially, of course, if you've got the distortion control cranked to a Spinal Tap approved 11. And that leads us very nicely into our final purveyor of filth, the pedal that started it all, the Fuzzbox. <laughs> Yup, this is the grandfather of distortion in a stomp box, the aptly named fuzz pedal. As mentioned earlier, it was born in the mid 60s and of the four family members we're looking at here, it is by far the most radical. Fuzz is capable of creating gnarly, heavily clipped and harmonically altered sounds that are often wonderfully unpredictable and also sometimes really hard to control. One big reason for this is that fuzz pedal circuits invariably use transistors and these gloriously lo-fi components add a heap of harmonics as they mercilessly mash your guitar signal into a square wave of doom. Not surprisingly, the type of transistor being used also impacts the type of fuzz created too. Silicone transistors deliver a bright, aggressive fuzz, while germanium ones tend to generate a smoother, warmer sound. The Dunlop Jimi Hendrix fuzz face is a classic example of satisfying silicone sizzle in action. Let's listen to a little piece of it, shall we? <laughs> Yeah, gloriously kind of out of control. I like it. Another classic device that has been dishing out fuzzy magic for decades is of course the Electroharmonics Big Muff Pie. And that's what I play out with. Let's check this bad boy out, shall we? <laughs> Hey. 
And there you have it, my friend. Hopefully this quick overview, coupled with some really awfully drawn diagrams of a guy walking down a corridor, has helped, well, unmuddy some of the pretty murky water that surrounds this wonderful family of stomp boxes. For more information on any of the pedals I've just played in this video, or any of the remaining 450 boost overdrive distortion and fuzz pedals we also offer, please go to sweetwater.com, or better still, call your sales engineer. I'm out of here. Stay dirty, my friend. Stay dirty. Thank you so very much for watching. Please don't forget to like, comment nicely, please, and also subscribe. Click here for more videos like this, or start at sweetwater.com for all of your music instrument and pro audio needs. Take care. Goodbye.